rules. Money rules. Money. Welcome to the Money Rules Podcast, where we tackle your personal financial matters with leading financial advisors. Your host, we do Melon Zorko. When investing, can our actions and emotions play a more significant role in eroding returns than the actual market movements? In other words, are we our own worst enemy? Behavioral finance has already established that our biases often impact our financial decisions with outcomes based on whether the biases exhibited by investors are positive or negative. A clear example of this is loss aversion, where investors tend to rush to conservative investments when market volatility hits. In this episode, we're joined by Alka Brink, a wealth advisor at PSG Wealth, and we'll be exploring how human behavior impacts investment returns, the challenges of market timing, and strategies to navigate the waves of market volatility. Welcome, Alka. Thank you for having me. It's one of the yeah. Alka, to kick things off, is it possible to time the market? Unfortunately not. And I think this is such a fascinating topic to me always because I think there's such a huge behavioral and emotional side when it comes to finance in principle, but specifically managing our investments and not letting emotions get involved, which not even the best of investors and traders manage to do this because it's difficult not becoming emotionally involved when it's your finances. So unfortunately, it is impossible to time the market. And as you mentioned in your intro, unfortunately, so many more returns have been negatively influenced and capital has been eroded, not due to the market movement, but due to the person sitting behind the computer making decisions and letting our emotions get involved. Could you maybe elaborate on why predicting market movements is so challenging and how it affects investors? Yes, definitely. So I think the stock market is completely an animal of its own. And it's important to understand that so many different moving parts influence a day to day Um, movement in the market and the nature of the stock market is literally every single day there is movement either upwards or downwards or in some cases sideways and so many different things influence this and it's impossible to get the timing correctly with that and and I think what makes it interesting in many cases also when we look at for example what's happening in a country's economy or political uncertainties or many factors that have a role when it comes to perhaps what you as a human are experiencing and what's happening in the stock market is completely not related at all. So definitely negativity, let's say there's a major event, should it be a war or a pandemic or big political movement in the world, it will have a movement on the stock market. But sometimes negative things that happen in the world actually has a very positive effect in the stock market and there's a positive opportunity to invest or to make a movement. So knowing what actually impacts the market on a day and how to react on it and getting the timing right. And and unfortunately, when you really go analyze the positive versus negative days in the market on a calendar year return, it's a 50-50 outcome. So if you look at the past few decades from the 1970s, the up days or the positive days was just over 50%. So in many cases, 51 to 53% per decade, where the down days were literally 48 to 49 percent of the time so getting that day right is nearly impossible and if you're not in the stock market or you're not where you need to be and you just miss one or two of these positive days your outcome will look completely different you actually just answered the the next question i had about how many good days are there really in a year with the ups and downs of the market as you mentioned what are the buying trends that you see when people either sell or or buy during stock market movements yeah so this is actually quite interesting and i think that's why you shouldn't try to time the market i think when it comes to to emotional behavior and loss aversion there's a very big trend when it comes to what we refer to as recency bias when it comes to the behavior investors have and you basically want to react on what just happened so if it was a really positive day in the market or the returns are looking good then investors want to invest but then they tend to climb in when it's just too late so you already missed the run or you missed the return and same to the other side when there were a few really bad days in the market and you've had a bad week and bad losses or or downside movements then investors tend to want to withdraw where you're already too late again in terms of now the curve or the market curve will most probably change. 
So it's actually really interesting when you go look at the inflows and outflows into the market and into many different portfolios is that the timing is literally the opposite. The moment the return starts declining again, investors want to invest in the market. And the moment when when it turns the other way around, they withdraw. So we tend to, as humans, get the timing wrong completely just because of reacting almost at the tail end of the cycle every time and not getting that timing right. Um, The same when it comes to to specific, um, I almost want to say timings in terms of, I think a lot of South Africans can at the moment relate to offshore investing, where the moment there's negativity around the country or around the currency, we want to increase our offshore exposure where where we tend to time it really badly actually around the currency and around um, when to buy into the offshore market. So again, on days when it's actually a good time to go into these markets, investors usually get the timing very wrong. And I think that's where investing is actually supposed to be a very boring, mundane process where it's not a day to day. Yes, there's a there's a place for day trading when it comes to specific stock picking, but overall you need to be investing consistently and remaining invested through these ups and downs. And overall you get the consistency and and what shows the, um, the compounding effect of the, this, is, which is quite interesting over a longer term, if you were to look at two different portfolios, and you just mentioned that I think there's that behavior that the moment there's uncertainty in the market or too much volatility, investors either withdraw or they want to switch to safe haven assets, so cash or, or potentially bonds, with the idea of at some point coming back into the market. And Because of this timeline and the the compounding effect of just a few positive days, if you, for example, over a 20-year period were to just miss out on a few best good days or positive days, your outcome can look completely different. And um, I'll I'll quote one or two numbers, but over a 20-year period, starting in specifically April 2004, and we pulled the data until, until 2023, until this year, if you were invested throughout this whole 20 year period, your average return would have been 14.41. If you just missed out on 25 good days, so 25 days over a 20 year period, so it's literally about one good day a year, you would have had a 4.94% return. That's almost a 10% difference in return just because of missing 25 good days. And then if we even take it into into more detail, you missed 100 good days, where 100 is still actually not a lot if you think of a 20-year period. Let's say you decided you're going to now climb out of the market for a few months in this year because there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. You would have had a minus 9.6% return. So it's a very scary outcome for, for trying to time it and just missing out on a few positive days that you don't know when those days will be. I touched on loss aversion and you mentioned recency bias. How should investors manage these biases? Yeah, so I think, unfortunately, when it comes to investing, like I mentioned in the start, no one likes seeing volatility or or feeling that you are potentially going to lose money or or be better, um, be worse off in terms of, of what you put in initially. But I think always going back to the drawing board in terms of understanding what the principle of the stock market is. So the stock market doesn't just go up in one line. They are always different movements every single day. But if you look at the stock market, both locally and globally, over the long term, it always um, grows. So there's always a positive return. If we were to look at where the JSE or where the S&P 500 was 10 or 20 years ago, we're in a completely different space. So it's not that it's moving negatively or um, you'll always earn a proper return over the long term. And you're essentially owning ownership in companies that are well-performing companies. So there's a reason we're investing in certain type of companies that that do perform well through different cycles. So not forgetting that you're still owning a unit of something. So investors only hurt themselves when the market is going through a cycle and then you disinvest. So then you realize your losses. So I think trying your best to take the emotion out of it through different cycles and, and keeping that bigger picture in mind. But I think when it comes to investing, and that's just a human behavior, like you mentioned, with loss aversion, investors tend to feel loss so much worse than they feel gain. So if the market is, for example, 4% down, investors panic 
immediately and there's a very large fear that kicks in. But if the market is up 20%, no one does anything. Everyone's super happy and they just expect it to be normal. So it's just a human nature thing. And I think if you know what the challenge is, then you can manage it. So knowing that we react emotionally, firstly, you can protect yourself, I think, by, by diversifying your portfolio a bit in terms of also including some safe haven, less volatile assets, so cash and bonds, for example, that just react less to volatility. And then when there are different market cycles sitting on your hands and not doing anything, and I think that's quite important where, where I think it does help having independent advice at that point in time to not make emotional decisions. I think it's important to know that that what we feel out of a, like I mentioned earlier, a sentiment point of view, if there's negativity in a country or let's use our own country as an example around load shedding and crime and a few principles that there are definitely negatives in other countries as well. But just because there's negativity around everyday life in the country doesn't mean your portfolio is necessarily doing badly. If we were to just look at the last calendar year's returns, the average portfolio did exceptionally well. So um, knowing that the, that these things are ne- not necessarily related, so not reacting on, on sentiment as well. Elke, investors are often encouraged to externalize their funds. But what mistakes have you seen them make when navigating offshore investments? I think when it comes to offshore investing, members also uh, investors also get the timing wrong in terms of when they try to make the move. Um, not only out of a market point of view, but also out of a currency point of view. Now, it's very difficult to time the RAND, firstly. It's an extremely volatile currency. If we just look at the past few months, um, there's, there's major movements to both sides, so it's not always easy timing it perfectly. I wouldn't always just use the RAND to, to move offshore. I think the reason should be to, to diversify your portfolio and to gain um, access to a different economy, different type of equities and companies. What's quite interesting is that, again, when we look at, at investor confidence or sentiment and the stock market, and specifically now focusing on the offshore side, the timing that investors get um, a little bit wrong in terms of, on average, when um, investing in the market, and we look at the last 50 years, investors buy in at the wrong time. So, they would typically buy in at a low and not um, buy in when you actually need to, to invest. So, for example, if you looked at the last reporting of, of what's going on in the S&P 500, where they, specifically in this case, CNBC reported that every time they said something negative and they said that the stock market was in turmoil, um, S&P 500 is suffering, your average return would, would have been 40% if you invested every time they made a negative comment about the stock market. Where investors don't tend to do that, they tend to buy in when it's too late, when you, you've missed the return. We're actually, when we're in turmoil or at a low in the market, that's the perfect time to buy in. So when investors tend to buy in in certain times, the average return, for example, um, and that's what I recently wrote an article about, when they were buying at a confidence peak and they feel, okay, it's going well in the market, we need to buy in now. Their average return was just over 3% over the long term. Where investors that bought in when the market's actually at a low or it's more a negative sentiment, their average return is 24%. So buying in at the different phases or buying in at the, at the dip of the market um, obviously put them in a much better place, but that's just not what investors tend to do. They tend to buy in too late um, when the market's already turning again. So I think it's impossible to get that timing right. Um, and that's where the consistency of just investing, irrespective of where we are in the market, is sometimes the easier route to go for, for many investors. So how can investors overcome this tendency to mistime the market and remain invested through different market cycles? I think the easiest thing for the average investor, when we're looking at a consistency point of view with investing, because I think eventually it all comes down to consistency also. So investing rather less on a monthly basis, but consistently and, and not trying to do only investing when you personally feel it's a, a less uncertain time in the world. So consistently contributing on a monthly basis to me is the easiest part in terms of in an automatic way you are dollar cost averaging not only the currency, so depending whatever happens with the RAN and the dollar movement, for example, you're buying in on different phases. And on the other side with different market cycles that that change every single day, if you're investing on a monthly basis, you will automatically invest throughout different cycles. Sometimes buying in at a low, sometimes buying in at a higher place. 
but averaging these behaviors out. So I would recommend trying to do just a more consistent approach to it and then just leaving it. So understanding what is your long-term plan and long-term goal regarding this and not trying to, to move around um, when there's uncertainty in the world, which there will always be. So, so knowing that these components of your portfolio in the stock market um, has a long-term return. So even if a war or a pandemic or a recession or any of the negative topics would come, to just remain invested. And I think if you really go look at the history of, of any um, stock market throughout all of these periods, the recovery actually tends to be quite quick um, when we look at different periods. So what's quite interesting when we look at different cycles, literally from 1950s, um, if we look at the complete crash in the market and a complete recovery, the longest time period is around, um, I just want to double check this um, in terms of the complete low to the complete high. Um, yeah, the, the longest period of time was around 11 months, which is actually scary. And this is if we look at the, the Russian financial crisis, the great financial crisis in 2008, we look at the SARS outbreak, we look at COVID-19, all of these crises from a complete 30 to 40 percent drop in the market to a complete recovery is actually a really short period of time. So I think taking that into account, so if you can just wait 20 months in a portfolio, um, you will completely be back at a 40 percent return to the positive. So knowing that this never lasts forever, in many cases, a market recovery only takes merely a few months. Um, so if this, this forms a part of your strategy, you will always be okay. But to just not make um, negative decisions throughout life phases, that, that happens consistently. Alka, you mentioned dollar cost averaging. For our listeners who may not know what it is, could you please explain it to them and how or why it's effective? So dollar cost averaging um, helps with if you're trying to time the market and you can't in terms of two different things, I think. Um, when it comes to currency specific, that you are buying in different phases the whole time. So let's just look at the RAND over the last two or three months. So many different implications that influences the RAND to move around quite a lot, even on a weekly basis. So by investing not just once a year, a lump sum, for example, but investing a monthly contribution um, every single month, you will automatically have different timings. So sometimes the RAND will be a bit stronger. Sometimes it will be a bit weaker. But overall, you're averaging out this um, effect that you have without trying to physically time it. And then together with that, the same applies to the stock market. So you will automatically be buying in a different phases that you can't necessarily, um, as an individual investor, time correctly. So some months you will be buying in perhaps at a bit of a low in the market. And other months they might be um, you're at the top of the cycle. But completely averaging out these um, different um, events in the market and, and not trying to get the perfect day right, but rather just doing it consistently and, and also then benefiting from time in the market. So um, for a longer period of time, most of your contributions will have time in the stock market and you'll enjoy a lot of these positive days that we spoke about as well. When constructing an investment plan, what steps should investors take to ensure they are aligned with their long-term goals? And could you also just share a few takeaways for our listeners as we wrap up? I think it's important when it comes to investing in principle um, to follow a few fundamental approaches and then sticking to them. So I think for most portfolios, following a well-diversified approach in terms of asset classes, so not just having exposure to the stock market, but also having um, more conservative asset losses. So having cash and bond exposure in your portfolio to balance out the volatility that I think this whole topic is about. It is difficult out of a behavioral point of view to experience volatility and you can soften the effect by by including um, more conservative asset losses as well. I think it's also important to define risk in terms of volatility does not necessarily mean risk. Just because the markets move in different cycles um, doesn't mean it's necessarily risky in terms of you just need time to ride out the volatility, but Equity exposure um, gives you that above inflation return, which is extremely important for any individual. I think if we were to compare it to just being invested in cash, for example, that would to me be risk in terms of inflation would deplete your capital um, very quickly, basically on a daily basis. 
So I think managing a diversified approach and not seeing one asset class as an alternative for another, and then knowing what the strategy is. We are planning for longer term goals, mostly when it comes to investment portfolios, so retirement or um, whatever the, the future goals might be. So know what your strategy is and then stick to it. So not to let the, the noise in the market that will will always happen in the short term impact your investment decisions. And I think there is value in working with a with a wealth advisor to take the emotion out of these different cycles in many cases. Um, and also building in the different goals, short term and long term goals, and then sticking to them. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode, Alka. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. That was Alka Brink, who is a wealth advisor at PSG Wealth. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Money Rules Podcast. To listen to more, go to moneyweb.co.za or the MoneyWeb app and follow MoneyWeb News for daily updates. Money Rules. MoneyWeb, Money. your trusted source for business and investment insights.